Shout aloud, do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet, declare to my people their rebellion to, and to the house of Jacob their sin. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and they seem eager for God to come and come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? And why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in the striking of each other with wicked fists. How fast, how you cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for a man to humble himself? Is it not for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fast I have chosen? To loosen the chains of injustice and to untie the cords of the yoke and to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked to clothe him, and not to, to, not, and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood, then your light will shine, excuse me, your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, and the pointing finger, with the pointing finger and malicious talk. And if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fall excuse me, never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will rise up the age-old foundations. And you will be called a repairer of the broken walls, restorer of the streets with dwellings. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, and if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it with it by your, excuse me, if you honor it, by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord and I will cause you to ride on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of the father Jacob. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Father, this morning we want to thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you that your word has the power to transform our lives. And Lord, we're interested in being transformed. We're desiring to be transformed from what we were to what you desire us to be. And Lord, today I pray that there be another work of the Holy Spirit that would transform us into more of your image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, that we would not use the same old excuse, that's just the way I am. But we would say, Lord, I'm changing because I sense the work of the Holy Spirit leading me to change into who you designed me to be. So, Lord, I pray that you'll help each and every one of us to hear your voice, to hear your word, and to begin to make steps in the direction you're leading this morning. That we will not be rebellious or stubborn and say, no, Lord, we can't go that way. But we will be submissive to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and we will absolutely know and understand what direction you want us to go today. So, Lord, we just thank you and praise you for what you're going to do through your word. And we ask this in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Remember last week we talked a lot about pleasing the Lord, how it's necessary for us to make sure that we live a life that is pleasing to God. All throughout the scripture, we see that men and women, children who obeyed God and did what God asked, pleased the Lord. And how God rewarded that, those pleasing, the, the way they lived, the way they, they did things. Because that was so important for them to once again make sure that we realize God did not create me to come down to this earth to do whatever it is I want to do. 
He didn't create us for that. He didn't create us to have a, a free reign just to go off and do whatever we want, whatever we want, and however we want to do it, and think that all of a sudden God's just supposed to be okay with that. He didn't do that. What he did is he spoke life into a creation, into us. We are his creation. He spoke life in us so we could breathe. Once we begin to breathe, we're birthed into this world. And then once we're birthed, we're to be trained to be specific kind of people. We weren't trained. We're not, we're, we're not here just to be trained to do what, whatever it is we want. Now, uh, most of us have jobs of some sort, except for the little ones. They don't have jobs yet. But most of us have been trained in some way to do something we've been uh, either desired to do or specifically been hired to do. Right? And so when, we, when we're hired by someone, they expect us to do a certain job so that we can get a paycheck, correct? You know what? Living your life for Jesus, you know what your paycheck is? Heaven. Heaven. Heaven's your paycheck. Yeah, you get benefits here, but the ultimate goal is you're going to go to heaven. And, and But let me just say, the alternative is you can go to hell. And some people say, well, I'll just go there and be with all my friends. You won't even know they're there because you're going to be so much pain and torment. You won't even know they're there. Because God will not allow hell to be this wonderful, awesome place like we've had on earth. And, uh, and, and even better, when we get to heaven, he's not going to allow hell to be like that. The Bible says hell is for the devil and his angels and those who reject him on earth. And so when you go to hell, you are in torment. You're in t torment forever. Why? Because you're separated from God. And total separation from God is not where you were designed to live for the eternity. Jesus Christ gave his whole life so that you and I would live our lives here on earth where it's pleasing to him. And when it's pleasing to him, we become a sweet smelling sacrifice to God that says, yes, that's exactly what I've been waiting to smell. That's exactly what I've been waiting to, to see happen. Why? Because when we do that, you can have a guarantee. First John 5, 13 says, I write these things to you that you may know that you have eternal life. Not eternal death. So there's great comfort in knowing that when we walk with God, it's, uh, it's one of those things that we can enjoy. We get to enjoy what God brings. Now, when God does bring that, that doesn't mean it's always easy, does it? For those of you that have been believers for a while, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There are challenges every single day sometimes that we face. But guess what? God has the ability to help you to overcome and so it's really, really important to watch that take place again. So when it comes down to fasting, obviously fasting is a, is a wonderful thing. Many people maybe have to fast when they go see the doctor. The doctor will say, don't eat anything or don't drink anything. And that might be the only time you've ever fasted in your life. But the Bible has a whole lot to talk about fasting and what fasting does. And isn't it interesting that there's, there's some things that I think that are interesting in God's Word. Number one, you can pray and not be heard. You can give and not be blessed. And you can fast and not God won't hear you. God won't answer your prayer. Why? Because we do it in a way that's not right. So the reality is, is that there are things that you can mimic or do that look spiritual that don't bring the results. And that's what this group of people, because he was writing to his church, he was writing to his people, and he said, declare to my people, in verse, two, verse 1, declare to my people their rebellion. In other words, these were Christians. These were people that were following God. And he's saying, hey, wait a minute. Let me declare to you your condition. And in declaring their condition, he gave them some things that they needed to do differently. But they began to respond to him. Look at what they said in, uh, in verse 3, and ver or excuse me, verse, yeah, halfway through verse 3, or verse 4, 3 and 4. Yet on the day of your fasting, oh, excuse me, verse 3, why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves, and you have not noticed? In other words, hey, God, did you not see what we just did? We did all this, and 
We don't hear, you don't hear us? You don't, we, we prayed and you don't do anything? You ever felt like that? Where you've prayed something and wondered if God even heard? Yeah, I've, I've had that. I've had that in, in times of, of long times where it's like, Lord, if you're going to do something in the land, do it here in Hamer, North Dakota. And God let me pray that for about a year and a half before something powerfully happened. Even though things were happening here, that was what we refer back to the awakening. But it took a, long, it took a while for, for God to answer that prayer. And so just because God doesn't answer us the first time doesn't mean that God isn't interested because God loves it when, he's, when we read in, in Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. God loves it when you're hungry. He loves it when you desire Him more than anything else. And guess what? That's what fasting is. Fasting is really desiring God more than your natural food, your natural desires, everything that you really enjoy about life, that's what fasting is, is where you get hungry and you get desiring and you get wanting more of what God wants. And I don't know about you, but what we're going to read today, I want to see every one of them while I live. I want to see it more and more. I want to see the miraculous. I want to see the powerful work of God. Why? Because I know He already wrote it and it has happened. But maybe it's never happened in Hamer, North Dakota. Maybe it's only happened just a little bit. But I want to see it happen more and more and more. So that what God wants to do can absolutely be done like He says in His Word. And that, my friend, will never happen unless you and I are hungry for Him. Just because we live here doesn't mean it's going to happen. God waits for us to get hungry. And by the time you get out of here today, you're going to be hungry. No, oh, just kidding. <laughs> I won't keep you that long. But the reality is, is that we naturally get hungry because we naturally feed ourselves at certain times of the day or maybe multiple times of the day. We're always eating and always, and some of us can get away with that. And <sighs> I'm one of those that can't. <laughs> But the reality is that when you, when you eat, when you feed yourself the Word of God, when you get this in you, it's amazing what God can do. It just takes you to a whole different, uh, I just want to say a whole different playing field where you get to do things God can trust you with. Because if, if, uh, if I were to take the keys of my vehicle today and I were to give them to Carlene... Yeah, I wouldn't give them to you. No. <laughs> I, could, I could probably trust her to drive it okay. But I don't know that she'd pay the insurance. I don't know that she'd rotate the tires and change the oil or whatever you might by say. Uh, I could also take my keys and give them to Brooks. I wouldn't let him take it out of the parking lot. Why? Not because he's a bad driver, but because he's not responsible enough yet. He hasn't come to the age of being responsible. So here's the thing about God. God will not give you things he knows you can't handle. And the only way you're going to learn to handle them is when you and I desire and hunger more of him to where he's able to feed us and give us exactly what we need for this day and this hour. But guess what? I've been hungry for God for a long time. I've, I've, we've been here almost 30 years now, and I've been hungry, and I don't know what you, what you see, but I'm, not, I'm, I'm still hungry. I want to see more. I want to see what God wants to do beyond where we've been. I want to go beyond that. Where I, When I read of old uh, revivalists and old preachers and old uh, evangelists and, and prophets and different ones that have spoken and seen the miraculous, like Reinhard Bonnke, he saw a guy get raised from the dead. The lady brought his dead body to the, to the meeting. And while he was preaching, he came back alive. I want to see that. I don't know about you, but I want to see that. That's, that's phenomenal. I mean, if God can do that, why? Because his life was not done yet. You can die prematurely. But when you die prematurely, we can pray and agree that, that God will raise you up. Because Psalms 139 says, every day of our life has been written in a book. And I want to make sure those days are fulfilled. That the devil doesn't cut them short. Or we don't cut them short because we're foolish in our own decisions. 
I want to see what God wants to do. Why? Not because I want it to happen here. I don't care if it happens in Devil's Lake, Jamestown, Fargo, Bismarck. I don't care where it happens. I just want to be a part of it. Because I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I want to see more. Why? Because I want as many people to go to heaven. I want as many people to know Jesus Christ here while we're here on this earth as they possibly can as long as I've got breath. Because once my breath is gone, I'm done. So the only influence you can really make in life is if you've got breath. If you've got, breath, if you've got breath in you, you've got the opportunity to make a difference. You've got the opportunity to make a change and transform and see things happen. So that's what we see when we jump into verse, verse 5 here. He says, Is this the kind of fast I have chosen, only a day for a man to humble himself? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord with a question mark behind it? He's like, no. Then he says in verse, in verse uh, 6, he says, Is not this the kind of fast I have chosen? To loosen the chains of injustice and to untie the cords of the yoke and to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke. Is not... Is it not to share your food with the hungry? Wouldn't it be cool to take food out of your out of your pantry or out of your house and can't wait to give it to somebody that has need, go back and there's more sitting there? <laughs> that would be cool. Because why? Because you're not just using it for you. You're taking what you've given and multiplied it. Well, where have we read that in the scripture where that happened before? Didn't Jesus multiply the bread and the fish? So why should we be surprised if that happens in our pantry? You take 10 cans out and pretty soon you got 12 left. Why? Because God loves it when we obey what, what it takes to do what God's asking. So if this is what, it, what a real fast is, we should be following some of this as well. Correct? Okay. Thank you for that. He says... Is not this, verse 6, the kind of fast I have chosen to loosen the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, to break every yoke? To, is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, clothe him, and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then look at what happens as a result of that, verse 8. Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Oh my! Isn't that interesting? Who has ever taught that if you give to the poor and you obey God in, in taking care of people, that your healing will happen in your body? When's the last time you ever heard that? Well, you heard it right here through God's Word. That your healing will quickly appear and your righteousness will go before you. You're not your bad old reputation of where you used to come from. Your righteousness will go before you. Why? Because when, when you allow God to begin to transform your heart, all of a sudden out of you begins to come things that people begin to recognize. That all of a sudden they say, that's not the old Jeff I knew. That's not the old Aaron I knew. That's not the old Howard I knew. Why? Because your righteousness is now going before you. Because you're setting something in motion because of a relationship with God that says, God, I'm hungry for you. I can't wait to hear what you've got to say. I'm desiring you more than anything else, and I will not go away until I'm satisfied. Do you remember the lady that pressed through the crowd to touch Jesus' hem on his garment? Did you notice the terminology that she had to use to get there? She had to press through the crowd to get there. It's not just an easy straight always to get to God. You've got to press through some things. You've got to battle through some things. You've got to fight for what you're wanting. And if you want something from God today, get in and fight for it. Get in and battle for it. Get say, I'll do whatever it takes. If it's fasting, I'll fast. If it's giving, I'll give. If it's sharing my food, I'll share my food. If it's, it's clothing somebody, I'll clothe somebody. I'll do whatever it takes. Why? Because I'm longing for what I know I need for this life. I'm wanting more of Christ. 
And so we begin to battle, we begin to fight, we begin to press through. Anybody ever had to press through just to make it through another day? When you woke up that morning, you did not care if you went anywhere. You didn't care if you went to work. You didn't care if you, you ate. You didn't care whatever. You ever had one of those days? I wasn't on my way here this morning. You weren't on your way here today. <laughs> I woke up and I was like, ah, oh, it's snowing. <laughs> I can use that for <laughs> And all of a sudden it's like, oh, no, you're not. <laughs> Get going, huh? <laughs> yeah. And this is what I needed to hear. Yeah, I hear you. You know, uh, I've told you this probably a, quite a few times, but do you know the only day I can usually sleep in is Sunday morning? I it is the weirdest thing. Every other day of the week, I am up between 4 and 6 or whatever it is. Sunday morning comes, I'll have to set my alarm because I won't wake up. That is the weirdest thing to me. But I just know that my flesh, even, even my flesh, I have to train it. I have to teach it, I have to battle it, I have to fight for it. So it's really an interesting thing. So there's a lot of work that God loves to do. Your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. In other words, he's going to protect the enemy from coming up and sneaking behind you. Yet anybody ever come up behind you and scare the tar out of you? Yeah, that can happen. But God says he'll be your rear guard. Not only your righteousness go before you, but he'll be your rear guard. Isn't that cool? That he's going to protect you on all sides. Why? Because if, you, if the, the devil knows one thing, he knows this. When the Bible tells us in the New Testament to put our armor on, all the armor is on the front. There's nothing on the back. Because you're never to run from the enemy, you are to face him and to defeat him just like Jesus did. So there's no armor on the back. It's all on the front. You're never to retreat from the enemy. You're never to fear the enemy. You are to go forward. Why? Because you've got Jesus Christ on your side. Your righteousness goes before you. You've got, you've got the glory of the Lord as your rear guard. And there's nothing but victory because Jesus never lived a defeated day in his life. Not one day was a defeat. Everything he did was out of obedience. Oh, the world thought he was defeated when they crucified him. But guess what? That wasn't the end. He was completely victorious that day because he rose from the dead and completely was amazing just how he stepped forward and did a powerful work. So then he says this, verse 9, Then you will call and the Lord will answer you. Huh. Great way to get your prayers answered. You will cry for help and he will say, Here am I. Notice he didn't say that earlier. He didn't say it to the people that fasted earlier. He said it to these people. Why? Because they learned to do exactly what God asked. And when you do what God asks, God always responds. Halfway through verse 9, he says, If you do away with the yoke of oppression and with the pointing finger and malicious talk. Wow. Yoke of oppression. Can you imagine what a yoke of oppression is? You ever felt like you've been oppressed by the enemy? By someone? I would say most teenagers feel oppressed by their mom and dad. Just don't let me do anything. Don't trust me with nothing. You, God, I have to answer for everything. Yeah, that's right. Until you start paying your own bills, it's a whole different ballgame. And when you become an adult, you want to go back and be a kid again because it was a lot easier. <laughs> Wasn't it? I get mom and dad's money. I get mom and dad's food. I don't have to pay much for bills. It toy. What an amazing deal. But the yoke of oppression. The yoke of oppression. Yoke was something that went over the neck. Just like an oxen when they went to steer them. The yoke went over their neck so that they could steer them which way they wanted to go. The yoke of oppression is something that wants to ruin your life. It's an oppression not from God. It's an oppression from the enemy. And God wants to bless your life. Oppression from the enemy wants to ruin your life. So if you feel like you're oppressed, good news is today, you can be free. Jesus Christ did not die on the cross for you to stay oppressed. He died on the cross for you to be free. And then he says, and something interesting, he says, with the pointing of the finger. Well, you've always heard it said that if you point at somebody, remember you got three pointing back at you, right? But the last thing that Christians, now remember he's writing to believers. He's not writing to sinners. He's not writing to people that don't care what God thinks. He's writing to the church or to believers. 
And he's saying, if you quit pointing your finger at each other instead of, instead of encouraging and building them up, Hebrews tells us, let us encourage one another daily as long as it's called today so that we might not be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. In other words, we're to be an encouragement to one another on a regular basis, and we need to get rid of the pointing of the finger and the malicious talk. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, verse 21, you have the power of life and, the, in, life and death in the tongue, so be careful what you speak, even flippantly. Sometimes we say things, oh, I don't really mean that, then why'd you say it? Because it's funny. You ever had that? I've got some funny things I wish I could say, but this, they would not be helpful to anybody. At least funny in my natural mind. In God's kingdom, it's not funny at all. So we have to be careful of the things that we say, like, yeah, uh, every year at this time of year, I always get a cold. Who wants that? Huh? You want to walk around going... Is that the way you want to walk around or not? No, I'd rather breathe free and have to lay down and not have to snore and my own wife have to go, eh, roll over. Because I'm breathing free, you know, there's no blockage, there's nothing stopping me and it's like, wow, pretty amazing how things can begin to happen. So be careful what you say. That talk is powerful. Then he says in verse 10, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness. In other words, not only does your righteousness go before you, but when you begin to put effort towards exactly what Jesus did, when he walked the earth, he helped people that needed help. When that takes place, guess what's going to happen? The light of what God's done in you is going to shine brighter than it's ever shined before. And what are you here for? You and I are here to be the salt and the light of the earth. Those are two positive things. The light can be snuffed out, though. And the salt can lose its saltiness. It can lose its ability. If it wasn't so, then he, why would they ask, can salt lose its saltiness? Yes, it can. They become completely, completely ruined by having no flavor. So what did they do with it? They threw it on the paths of men, only to be walked on. It wasn't meant for food. It wasn't meant to be flavor. So guess what? When you and I allow Jesus Christ to get in us so much, we can begin to see and experience the light of the world shining through us and the salt of, of who God is that brings flavor to life continue to go before us and go with us and go everywhere we are to where we begin to affect people's lives. And when we do that, we're doing exactly what Jesus did. And then you'll begin to see some benefits of what he said here. He says, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord, verse 11, the Lord will guide you always and he will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You remember the, the story of Elijah in the Bible? Elijah prayed and it didn't rain for three years. That's a powerful prayer. And in three years, he had ravens that would feed him. In other words, in a sun scorched land, God knows how to take care of his own kids. So if things get tough in the United States, guess what? If you're a believer, God will take care of you. He will provide for you. He will supply what you need. You can trust that. You can know that. Because God will, he will, he will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. It's an amazing promise. And he says, he will strengthen your frame. He will strengthen you so that you'll be able to do exactly what you were designed for. Look at the very next part of that, verse 11. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Huh. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty good picture. I've seen some amazing gardens over the year, and one of them's right outside my house my mother-in-law takes care of. She knows how to make a garden grow. She knows how to get a good produce out of, out of, out of things that she planted. And so to become a, a well-watered garden one that produces, it has to be taken care of. And it has to be one of those that where there's a constant supply of water. Uh, in, invariably, during the summer, last summer, 
Every other day she was asking me to water the garden. Every other day. Now if something we put in the ground needs that much water, how much water do you think you need to grow spiritually? Sunday's not going to take care of you the rest of the week. This fact that we're going through this part of the book today will not cause you to be, be a well-watered garden by next week. You'll be dry and you'll be thirsty. Why? Because you and I need water every day. In fact, they say our body needs anywhere from 8 to 10 glasses of water a day. In fact, you can take your weight and times it times so many ounces and you're supposed to drink that many. Help me out. So I weigh... One ounce. One ounce of water per body pound. So I weigh 120 pounds. That means I should drink 120 ounces of water. What? You look at me like I'm not telling the truth. I might not be. I might have to add 100 pounds to that. And more. But anyway. So if we need that much water naturally, what, what does that mean spiritually? And I don't know, I, I, don't get, I, I really have a tough time understanding why we as believers think that we can make it through life without reading our Bible. I don't know how in the world we think we're going to make it spiritually. It's crazy for us to even think like that. Why? Thy kingdom come, or I should say, no, wait a minute. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our... Uh, what was that? Daily bread. Huh. So God expects you to eat spiritually every day. That is not just food. You're not asking God for just food. You're asking God for daily sustenance that causes your spirit to grow and to live and to be alive and well. Why? Because he can't wait to be the righteousness that shoots before you. He can't wait to be your rear guard. And he can't wait for you to be the garden that everybody looks at and says, what are they doing in their life? How come they look so good even though life is not dealing on such a good card? Why is that? Why? Because I am completely engulfed in what God wants me to be uh, investing in my life. And when I do that, I've got opportunity to grow. I've got an opportunity to, to, to shine. I've got an opportunity to affect people's lives. It will be a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Verse 12. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins. Well, that's interesting that he's saying that to the church, isn't it? Maybe your community where you live at one time used to have something spiritual going on but has nothing going on right now. That's ancient ruins. Ancient ruins. And God says, if you'll, you and I will allow him to do in us we'll have the power and the potential to once again give life to something that used to be there. Well, they used to be like that, but they're not that way anymore. Well, that's not a good report. God wants us to give a good report. God wants us to be a good report. And so as a church and as believers, we want to make sure that we're that well-watered garden. And I want that for other churches as well, but as long as I'm here, what I want for you and I want for myself is that we become that one that can repair or restore the ancient ruins. And we'll look at the next part. And we'll raise up the age-old foundations. And you will be called a repair of the broken walls, a restorer of the streets with dwellings. Amazing verse for the believers. You know, when, when churches believe in Jesus Christ... That should literally be the life of the community. Should literally become the life of the community. Why? Because we have a, an amazing river that never runs dry. So now we need to continue to walk in this stuff so that we can exceed the power of God. Demonstrate what he says here in his word. Then he says in a bunch of uh, things in verse 13 and 14, and then we're done. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath... And from doing as you please on my holy day. Oh, by the way, in the Old Testament, the Sabbath was a specific day. In the New Testament, your Sabbath is every day. If you didn't know that, you need to know that. Every day is a Sabbath day with God in the New Testament. And that's what we're living in today. The fact that you came here today is pleasing to God. But it's not enough. 
You'll never get to heaven by going to church one day a week. You'll never grow spiritually by going, reading your Bible or doing things one day a week. It will never happen because God didn't design us to do that. The Old Testament was that way, but the New Testament, every day is a Sabbath day with God. So then he says, if you keep this, call the Sabbath of the light, then the Lord's holy day honorable. And if you honor it by go, not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord. Huh. Let me ask you this. There's a difference between being happy and being joyful. Anybody can be happy at certain occasions of life. When a team wins a championship, there's a whole bunch of people happy. When, when, when you win, uh, when, uh, let's just say you enter a drawing and you win the prize, like yesterday at the homeschool convention, you could uh, purchase different things and then be in the top prize for a computer. Well, when I ran across the guy that won the computer, he was sitting there with a smile on his face, going, wow, this is great. Why? Because he won something. It was a happy occasion for him. When your husband buys you flowers, candy, ice cream, new furniture. What else, ladies? Ring, jewelry, vacation. Ah, cool. You're a happy camper, aren't you? Woohoo! Whatever makes you happy. That might not be in the top of your list, but I'm just saying. But the reality is it's not hard to be happy at times. But what about joy? Joy is that consistent thing that exists in my life that no matter what happens, I will never lose the joy of knowing who God is. I'll never lose the joy of knowing I'm serving Jesus Christ and He's worth every ounce and every, every bit of my life that as I give it to Him, I have the joy of the Lord is my strength. That is a major difference in the scriptures of what you see between happiness and joy. So he says, then you will find your joy in the Lord by not doing it as you please and going your own way. And I will cause you to ride on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father's Jacob. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. I don't know about you, but that seems like a pretty good promise to hang on to, doesn't it? Doesn't it? That's good. I'm glad you agree. Because I didn't write it, God did So let me ask you, is your life bent on pleasing God or is it bent on pleasing yourself? Because if it's not bent on pleasing God, you're going to find that to be very empty. You're going to have to be chasing a lot of different things that the world chases. And you're going to, you're going to go after this and get it. And it's like, oh, that wasn't so much. And, and all of a sudden you get this and it's like, oh, that, that ended up being kind of a dry run. And, and all of a sudden you get this, and that's what everybody else is shooting for. They got that, so they're happy, so I'm going to get that. And I'm, and I'm, yeah. That's not quite what I'm looking for. What is it they say? If you do what you love, you'll never work another day in your life. That's what they say. When you love Jesus and you live every day for Him, living for Him will never be a drag. It'll always be a joy. It'll always be something that will fulfill what God designed you to fulfill because you're doing things His way rather than doing them your own. Would you just take a moment with myself as well and uh, just ask God, is there anything I was doing for myself that I shouldn't be? Is there anything I'm doing that's just to please me and I need to get rid of that and just make sure it pleases you, God? Would you just take a moment and ask the Lord that question this morning? you get an answer, or maybe not, uh, maybe you're still waiting for an answer. The second question of the scripture was today that if you 
if you do as you please on the Lord's day? What do you got planned the rest of this day that God might need you to rearrange? Because God didn't give you this day just to do what you wanted. He gave us this day to do what He wants us to do. And maybe the Lord would redirect your day today if you gave Him the opportunity. And in doing that, there's a whole bunch of blessings that will come your way because you're choosing to do what He wants rather than what you want to do. So ask the Lord if there's something that needs to be rearranged for the rest of your day. You know what the Lord just told me? He said, it's not my fault you wasted your time doing your own thing. So if you feel like you got to do something today that's not on God's agenda, just remember, God didn't ask you to waste time. You chose to do it your own way, which was a waste of time. <laughs> Man, that's a slap in the face, ain't it? I mean, wow, think about that. I get behind because I choose to do things God never designed me to do anyway. And I end up doing a bunch of things that I think are important. God says, I don't need. And all of a sudden, I'm at my wit's end because I don't have time to do what God asks. And it's like, well, that's not God's fault. That's my, my choice. So I have to learn to hear God's voice, learn to regularly on a daily basis say, Lord, what do you need done today? Because you know what I was designed for. You know what I was created for. And if I'm not here to please you, it's going to be a waste of a day. So... Make sure that the rest of this day, because we're all informed today you now, <laughs> we're responsible. If you didn't know that, you wouldn't be responsible. But now that we all know that from God's word, we're responsible to fulfill the rest of this day the way he wants it done. So let's pray. Father, thank you and praise you.